Richard Wolff is an American economist who's very active on YouTube, particularly on the channel Democracy at Work, which has some great discussions about global capitalism and talks about China quite a lot. He put out quite a thought-provoking video recently, which I think raises quite a lot of questions about the labor movement in China. In this video, I'll show you three short clips from it and talk about some of the issues that they raise. Wolf puts forward the analysis, which I largely agree with, that rising inequality and falling living standards in the US and elsewhere, in fact, is leading to more authoritarian forms of politics as people who feel they've lost out look to strong leaders to protect their interests, while at the same time those with more wealth look to strong leaders as well in the hope that they will help them to keep what they've got. Meanwhile, certain opportunistic political figures, rather than addressing these economic problems in meaningful ways, ride this wave of discontent and shore up support for themselves by blaming scapegoats, and that might be immigrants, and quite often it's China. The condition of the American working class is in deep trouble. And that has allowed demagogic politicians to cash in, to find a scapegoat. Immigrants, that's popular, as if that was the problem. Or China, as if that was the problem, rather than how the United States deals with a competitor. So Wolf talks about how politics in the US is becoming more authoritarian, but he says in the case of China, they're authoritarian already. So they're not turning more authoritarian the way that the US is. Now the Chinese call it socialism. Particularly they call their society socialism with Chinese characteristics. Here's what they mean. That it's a mixture, as I've described it, of private and state enterprises. And that mixture is overseen, is controlled from above by a powerful communist party and the state government that is ultimately controlled by that party. So that's a very interesting model, quite different from the United States, which doesn't have a large sector called state-owned and operated enterprises and doesn't have a powerful communist party and is only now beginning to support an authoritarian state. So the Chinese already have one. So they're not in a way turning towards more of it because they already in a sense have it. But why are they determined to hold on to it? He finishes by suggesting that while authoritarian governments might be able to safeguard a functioning capitalist system for a while, we will likely see the social contradictions produced under these systems sharpen, leading to workers pushing back against the state and these capitalist interests, leading eventually to a different kind of system, which Wolf suggests will be a kind of participatory workplace democracy. And interestingly, he makes this claim about China as well. My guess is the very success of what the Chinese have achieved in economic development is producing a working class in China, which, like the working class in Western Europe, North America, and Japan, will experience the contradictions that afflict a system structured the way capitalism has. And they will rediscover the old socialist idea that the best solution to the problems of capitalism, private or state, are to question, to challenge, and to go beyond imagining that we have to organize the production process with a minority running the show and a majority doing the work. There are two questions here that I think this raises. First is this idea that China is already authoritarian. They don't need more of it. It can't get more authoritarian. I know what he means here. China isn't shifting from some kind of democracy to an authoritarian state, but it certainly has been becoming more authoritarian, particularly in recent years. And this has been having a major impact 
on the existing labour movement. And second, this drawing of a sort of equivalence between the labour movement in the US and the labour movement in China raises some interesting questions because while they both are operating within the same broad international capitalist structures, the labour movement in China is also facing very specific and distinct challenges. In fact, a recent article posted on the blog site Chuang, that's a blog site which posts commentary from often anonymous Chinese labour activists, has interesting things to say about both these issues. The article talks about how we've just passed through a period of actually relative optimism for labour activism and the labour movement in China, particularly following 2010 and the Nanhai Honda auto workers factory strike. Lots of people were pointing to this moment and the many, many different strikes that followed onto this, saying that actually this looks like a possible opening of possibilities for where the Chinese labour movement might go and we might finally begin to see a coherent working class movement emerging. But by 2019, all of that had come to an end with the systematic targeting of labour activist networks and their support systems by various state actors. The article suggests that this moment 2019 marked a real turning point in terms of what is and isn't possible in the labour movement in China. And in this context, the article actually warns against assuming that the path of the labour movement will proceed more or less the same in China as it has in Europe and America because the kinds of issues that are being faced in China are actually very different. Wolf does kind of seem to do that in that video, although I know that he is simplifying for the point of making an argument. For example, the labour movement in China tends to be particularly fragmented and localised. Many workers are migrants coming into the cities from the countryside and many are local urban workers in state-owned factories. And the two groups historically have been treated very, very differently by the state and had very distinctive sets of interests. And this is one reason why the very sophisticated repressive measures that the state uses to keep the labour movement under control have been so effective. So while I definitely appreciate Richard Wolff's optimism, there are still serious questions to be asked about the possibilities and the potential for a strong and coherent labour movement in China. Thank you for watching.